priests will start today's proceedings with their chanting. Om Sri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om Gyananam Dva Ghanapati Jumma Vamahe Kavinta Bhina Mupamashravastham Jeshalajam Brahmanam Brahmanaspada Anashrinvan Nodhi Vissi Hasadhanam Om Bhadrangarne Vishruniya Madheva Bhadram Vashe Maja Virjatra Stirangi Sarashtuvan Sastano Vihi Vishena Devani Tamya Dayu Svastina Indra Vrtashrava Svastina Pusha Vishra Veda Svastina Star Chovan Vishrenimi Svastina Vrhaspadir Dhanadu Om Shanti 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 Arihi Om something rings so please make sure it's silent um, also just a few announcements on May 21st there is a program called the, uh, spearheaded by Swami Ishat Mananda Ji from the Vedanta Society uh, the flyers are on all your seats I hope you saw them so I will not go through all the details but it's May 21st and 12th uh, Ramakrishna Mission Order monks will be all here in this temple and Swamiji will also be here. So please try to attend that program. Uh, all the details are in the flyer. And the third thing, um, again I'm going to ask for all of you to be generous and make a donation to HTGC. Hindu Temple of Greater Chicago, if you're writing the check. Some of you asked me about credit card, so you can happily give your credit card payment in the front desk. Just tell them this is for this event, okay? And um, so then we are on the final day of the program. Swamiji, I don't know what to say to you, but from all of us here, we are so grateful that you have actually transported all of us to a plane that I can't describe. Everybody's saying the same things. Thank you so much. You're very good. In the essence of Karma Yoga, that Swamiji taught, taught us yesterday, Aradhana, Samarpana Buddhi, and most of all, Prasada Buddhi, I thought it would be pertinent to choose a chant from Shiva Manasa Puja. So I will try my best to chant it now. <coughs> Karma karomi, tat 
दत्तखिलम् शंभो तवारादनम् करचरणकृतम् वा आयजम् कर्मजम् वा श्रवणनयनजम् वा मानसम् वा पराधम् विहितम् अविहितम् वा सर्वमेदश्चमस्व जय जय करुणाप्ते Shriyatirajaya Vivekananda Surai Satchit Sukha Swarupaya Swamine Tapaharini Thank you for that very kind introduction as always Nityaji. Um, namaskars to the uh, temple administration, the organizers of this event and dear friends who have gathered in such large numbers. You know, once Sri Ramakrishna said, what does it feel like in a crowd when there are a lot of people? He says, have you seen a chandelier like that? You see, a chandelier where light is reflected from so many uh, the crystals, the glass which is hanging there, it's like a mass of light. So, an enlightened person who, is, who sees a crowd of persons, Sri Ramakrishna says, it's like this divine chandelier, consciousness shining everywhere. What is that consciousness doing? It is seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and touching and thinking and all, all of that. This is the play of this light. It's exactly like that. It's like a huge chandelier of God all around. When you come to this temple, just now I was thinking when we were bowing down to the deities, there's a beautiful doctrine in Sri Vaishnavism. Uh, those who are from Tamil Nadu, they know. Uh, goes back to Ramanuja Acharya, actually much older than that, much older. Ramanuja was the uh, Bhashyakar who uh, gave this, the interpretational, the commentarial foundation for Sri Vaishnavism. But there's a beautiful doctrine there that God, how gracious is God to all of us. The original, the source is Narayana in Vaikuntha. So the transcendent form of God. Now in order to be compassionate to all of us, this Lord who is transcendent is also immanent. Immanent means in all things. So the same Lord is the Antaryami in all living beings. The inner controller, the consciousness within each of us. 
So in our heart is the Narayana of Vaikuntha in our heart of all living beings. That's the second, second manifestation. For out of compassion for us, coming, becoming more and more accessible. And then the third manifestation, even more compassionate, is the avatar. So Sri Narayana is now Sri Rama, Sri Krishna, and all the avatars who appear as human beings. They're not human. They appear as human beings amongst all of us. Sri Ramakrishna gives a very beautiful uh, interpretation. There's a little pool in which little fishes are playing. At night, the moon, the full moon is reflected in the pool. And the little fishes play with that reflection, thinking, here is a nice fish. We make friends with it. And when the night is gone and the moon disappears, they feel, where has our friend gone? The friend, that glorious reflected moon, was never there in that pool, actually. It appeared among them and played with them for a while and then disappeared. That's an avatar. Out of compassion for us, the Lord takes human forms and plays with us, stays with us for a while and shows us the way out of our suffering, the solution to our problems. Third, avatar. Narayana in Vaikuntha, then in the hearts of all beings, says Antaryami, in all beings is present. And as like a human being, uh, as one of us amongst us as avatar occasionally. And one variation of the avatar you will find in the Bhagavatam, which is the fourth, for the sake of completion, I have to mention it. That is, when Krishna, uh, out of compassion for the go gopis, not only as Krishna, but as many Krishnas, and play with each of the gopis separately. So that is that vyuha, that is the fourth manifestation out of compassion. But why I'm saying all this is the last one, the fifth one, which is called Achya Avatara. So in a temple where ritualistically the Lord has been invited in a vigraha, in an image, a consecrated image, the Lord has been invited and established there and worshipped carefully, daily. That same divine presence is present here. Narayana and Vaikuntha, in all our hearts, as Rama and as Krishna, and the Krishna of the gopis, is present in the Vikraha where we bow down to, in each of the temples, in all the forms of divinity. They are not symbols. We think, oh, we say, no, 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 we are not worshipping uh, images. Hey, these are symbols, it stands for God who is beyond everything. True, but also there is a divine presence in the uh, Vikraha, which radiates in the temple. You can feel it. Those who are lucky, it's a little sattvic mind, we feel it. We, we sense this radiance which is shining there. So, these are the five, you know, how Lord manifests. This is Sri Vaishnava doctrine. Vishishta Dvaitavada. So, what can religion do for us? We are here, you know, like a sales pitch. You have to come and pitch it. The God has to come and pitch. What can I do for you? Please tell me, before we hire you, why should we hire you? Why should we hire God? Why should we give him a job? What can God do for us? So this was the question asked by a bhikshu, a monk. And this is in the original Buddhist scriptures. So a monk asked the Buddha a long time into the Buddha's teaching. So you remember Buddha, he taught for nearly 40 years. He passed at the age of 80. Swami Vivekananda says, look at the, the acceptance and the tolerance of the Hindus. Here is a spiritual master walking the dusty roads of North India for 40 long years, criticizing your Vedas, criticizing uh, the, the existence of, of God and immortal soul, Atma and Ishwara and teaching. And how do the Hindus respond to this criticism? With overwhelming love, devotion, acceptance, ki, ha, ye bhi hai. <laughs> and with lot of people became his followers, a huge movement. Now one day, a monk asks the Buddha, I have a doubt. What doubt? Many years ago you attained enlightenment. You saw there is sorrow. Therefore, Buddhist truths, four noble truths, there is sorrow, dukkha. There is a cause of sorrow, trishna, the desire. And there is an end to sorrow. It is not an incurable disease. It's a curable disease. 
And there is an end to sorrow, nirvana. And there is a course of treatment, a method of treatment. It's not incurable. I'm just reminded two years ago, um, this very well known Pakistani uh, doctor, oncologist, cancer uh, doctor, Reza Azrati. She wrote a book, The First Cell. She's spreading awareness about uh, you know, early detection and treatment of cancer. So uh, she told us, this was it at Harvard Bookstore, she was launching that book. She said, the sorry state of cancer treatment. <laughs> she was saying that my elder brother is a heart, as a cardiologist, heart doctor. And when my mother comes from Pakistan, we sometimes walk down in a you know, mall or somewhere. And my brother's patients come up often, shake hands, thank you doctor. So my mother asked me, how come we never meet your patients? Do kya karti hai? Your brother she? And then she said, how sad it is, how can I tell my mother, my patients are either dead or dying. So late detection of cancer, a lot of struggle is there, lot of... But the Buddha says, this cancer of worldliness, of suffering, has a cure, uh, nirvana. And you can, there's a method, Ashtanga Marga, uh, the eightfold path. We all learned this when we were school, students in school. I remember class eight, you had to memorize, get two marks, if you write down the answer in the CBSC question. Now, you taught all this, the monk said to Buddha, but you saw that sorrow is there, you know, that's how Prince Siddhartha became the Buddha. Uh, he saw, what do you remember the four sides? Old person he saw, diseased person he saw, dead body he saw, and then finally he saw a monk, and then he decided to search for liberation. But now I notice we are all becoming old, that monk said to the Buddha. We are following your path, we are becoming old. Many of us are getting disease. Some of us already, we are original students, we have died also. You are also getting old. And your body is also becoming, you know, this disease and finally, one day your body will surely die. How have you overcome sorrow? You said, old age, disease, death, this is sorrow, and there is a solution for that, and I will teach you the solution. But we are also becoming old. You see the question? How has your teaching solved problems? Then the Buddha gave the answer. This is a very important insight into what spirituality can do. What is spirituality all about? The Buddha said, you know, what is the nature of suffering? The nature of suffering is, imagine a person is hit by an arrow. Imagine the shock at the pain. And immediately he is hit by a second arrow. Imagine the shock and the pain again. Now, the first arrow is what the world throws at you. Ups and downs in life, financial problems, health problems, old age, disease, death. All of this is the first arrow. The second arrow is our reaction to it. The suffering that we have internally, every time problem comes, how we suffer. That's the second arrow. What I teach you will take care of the suffering caused by the second arrow. Not the first one. The first one, that is the nature of samsara, it will continue. Very important insight. Even for Buddha, for Ramakrishna, for Vivekananda and so on, everybody, body got disease. There was pain, suffering, death of the body. But what they could claim was, we are above that suffering, it is alright. I have found something from that perspective, I have overcome suffering, you also can do it. <clears throat> and they showed by their life. In the midst of trouble also they could survive and be at peace. Sri Krishna says to Arjuna, what am I teaching you? And he says that Yasmin stito dukkhena guruna apina vichalyate Being established in that, even the heaviest of sorrows cannot shake you. I am teaching you that. Yan labdhvan achapanam lavan manyate tato adhikam Having got which, having attained which, having reached which, you will not feel there is anything greater to attain in life. You have attained the goal of life. Notice that the what we call the enlightened persons, all the great saints, enlightened ones, they experience the same problems that everybody else experiences. Physical, 
in life whatever comes ups and downs sometimes they experience more than us worse so much struggle in their lives and yet they have this unique distinguishing quality they have peace they have joy ma sharada she used to say she had a hard life but she said my child i don't know what is sorrow he meaning sri ramakrishna established a picture of joy in my heart a picture of bliss in my heart so no matter what happens you know that means i still have that overflowing bliss in my heart how can we get that to overcome the sorrows and ups and downs of the of life notice that second arrow and first arrow these are two different things one is what happens in the world but if that old age disease death happens automatically there will be suffering we may ask not automatically two people doctors know this same disease two people two patients react in two different ways every doctor knows this some with a small problem and quite treatable they break down some with a life threatening disease they are calm which means the internal reaction is very very important one sadhu i liked it so much in uttarakhand himalayas he said shant man mein bhala sansar kaun dekha hai mahatma ji in a peaceful mind in a serene mind in a cool mind who has seen trouble of samsara see how insightful we normally think just the opposite it's counterintuitive we think samsara is troublesome my worldly problems my daily problems there are so many problems therefore my mind is disturbed he is saying just the opposite because your mind is disturbed you have problems of samsara he said no 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 that is escapist there is real problem there it's not just because my mind is disturbed but again the same principle applies notice same problem two different persons react in two different ways a financial problem relationship problem health problem somebody is calm in the midst of lot of problems also very effective doing your work in the job taking care of the family another person with minor problems with physical mental breakdown that means what's the difference between them the problem is the same might be a disease might be some trouble some person might be something but the two persons react to it differently because the two minds are different so real suffering or not suffering is in the mind i'm not denying there are problems outside but our reaction see the wisdom of the buddha that second arrow is most important what we do with the second arrow go back even before the buddha sankhya philosophy there is a text called sankhya karika which is the oldest available text on sankhya philosophy it starts with a verse giving the argument for spiritual life why should we be interested in spiritual life at all first verse of sankhya karika it was written by a great um, master ishwara krishna first verse dukkhatraya vigata jihasa tad apaghata ke hetau drishte sapatha chet ना एकांत अत्यंत अभावात प्रोफाउंड वर्ड्स ऑफ विजडम रिटर्न दिस पर्सन ईश्वर कृष्ण लिव्ड अबाउट मे बी आफ्टर बुद्ध मे बी सेवेंटीन एटीन हंड्रेड इयर्स गो बट द सांख्य फिलोसॉफी इट सेल्फ इज प्री बुद्धिस्टिक लॉन्ग बिफोर बुद्ध बिकॉज द बुद्ध हिमसेल्फ सेज ही टॉक्स अबाउट हिज टीचर्स हूम ही वेंट टू ही वेंट टू टू और थ्री वेल नोन टीचर्स बिफोर ही डिड हिज ओन साधना सो द टीचर्स वॉट दे टॉट हिम इफ यू सी वॉट वॉट ही रिपोर्ट्स बुद्ध हिमसेल्फ is sankhya sankhya doctrine has been talked to him and a form of yoga which later came to be known as patanjali yoga those are the things he learned and lot of that he incorporated in his uh, teachings of buddhism what does this verse mean afflicted by hit by three kinds of sorrows all sorrows he classifies under three three kinds of sorrows humanity seeks a way to overcome these sorrows what kind of sorrows in that same old classification we are familiar with adhyatmika adidaivika uh, adibhautika that means sorrows related to body mind illness old age infirmity uh, physical mental illness all of this is adhyatmika physical problem mental problem here then problems which come from nature too hot too cold um, famine all sorts of problems um, you know global warming problems caused by other beings in you know, old texts 
you will see caused by other human beings and also Vyagra, Mashakavi, by tigers and mosquitoes. Now here in Chicago we have neither tigers, I think no mosquitoes also. But human beings cause problems all around us. Whether it is in small farm, in every house or neighborhood or Ukraine, Russia, whatever it is, it is human created problem. So all these three kinds of sorrows, they afflict us. They constantly, they, they are harassed, humanity is harassed, troubled by sorrow. And they seek um, how to overcome sorrow. Somebody wrote, Swami, my 11 year old daughter said, what is all this thing about seeking happiness and overcoming sorrow? I get happiness in life, I will accept the sorrow also. Sorrow and happiness both are fine. I did not have any answer to that Swamiji. What answer can I give? I said, for God's sake, she is 11 years old. She does not know what sorrow is. That's why she is doing such philosophical things. And I hope and pray that she will never know what sorrow is. She can continue to be foolish. But no, life will not spare anybody. So we will come to recognize sorrow. Can you tell uh, somebody afflicted, uh, child has died, the heaviest sorrow that a human being can face. Can you go and tell, you have got happiness, now take the sorrow also, no problem, it's all right. Can you ever imagine saying such a thing? No. It's only a foolish person or a child who can say such a thing. Sometimes we have this modern disease of worshipping what children are saying. Because people love their children. So for the children, every child is, uh, you know, um, Krishna or daughter is Saraswati. Whatever they say is the teaching of the gods. Not at all. They are children. All these scriptures are there, spiritual masters are there. Set them aside. My child said this. What profound wisdom, Swamiji. <laughs> Not only that, it goes to the extent, I remember one gentleman, out of goodness of his heart, he said, I feel this dog, in New York dogs are very important, this dog, we have got so much, I watch my dog and I feel I have so much to learn for, from life, for about life from the behavior of my dog. I was thinking, my God or dog, from God to dog, you are a human being. You have the benefit of philosophy, science, religion, spirituality. Finally, you have to watch a dog to learn. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is modern foolishness. Pull out of this. So, afflicted by sorrow. Sorrow is serious. One should never take it lightly. Sorrow is serious. And afflicted by sorrow, humanity tries to overcome. Tad jihasa tad apaghata ke hetau. What are the ways to overcome sorrow? Next, in all in one verse, he says, drishte sapartha chet. But there are so many worldly ways of overcoming sorrow. Why go for spirituality? There is, I am quoting from a commentary on Sankhya Karika by Vachaspati Mishra, one of the greatest scholars and saints of masters of philosophy from ancient India who lived nearly more than a thousand years ago. He was equally a, a master of Advaita, of Sankhya, of Purva Mimamsa, of Nyaya uh, and uh, Yoga. He has written commentaries on all of them. So he has written Sankhya Tattva Kaumudi, the moonlight which explains the uh, teachings of Sankhya. There he says, so many worldly ways are there. Uh, you, are, you have a disease, go to the doctor. You have uh, financial problems, take a loan. You have, uh, you are bored, there is manoranjana, entertainment, nowadays full of entertainment, TV and internet and all. So why would you go to uh, a spiritual solution, drishta, the seen, the visible, direct ways of overcoming suffering are there in front of you. Why look for something spiritual? Answer, why? He says, no, the worldly means are not sufficient. They are, he says, ekanta atyanta bhava. None of the worldly means are sure of curing your suffering. Even we noticed how here in the most advanced countries, in New York, I saw uh, at the height of the COVID pandemic, more than a thousand people were dying per day in one of the most powerful, one of the richest communities in the entire world. In New York uh, pride themselves in being the greatest city in the world. And in some of the poorest countries in the world, they, they went through this pandemic quite unscathed. How do you know 
that all our technology, our wealth, our medical science will work. May not. To some extent, it's a matter of probability sometimes. So, ekanta bhavat. And even if it works, it's worse than, no, even if it works, still worse. It works, but then it will have to be repeated. This disease is cured, another comes up. Today you satisfy hunger, in the evening you are hungry again. You may take food again, in the morning you are hungry again. Atyanta bhava, there is no solution uh, to sorrow. Nobody here or anywhere in the world, we can say that after trying for years and years in all sorts of ways to remove my suffering and gain some measure of peace, uh, some lasting satisfaction, who can claim that uh, I have succeeded? after trying for 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, 80 years, forget what we have done for others. Have we done enough for ourselves? Are we at peace? Is everything okay with us forever? No. No. There's something wrong in what we are trying. We are trying these worldly ways of getting peace, of satisfaction, not working. They say that society, the definition of lunacy is to keep trying the same thing and expecting different results. In that sense, we are all <laughs> lunatics. We are trying the same thing again and again. What our parents and grandparents have tried, what people in society are trying, we are trying again and again, trying to get satisfaction, op uh, overcoming sorrow, not working. And hence, here comes spirituality. In all its forms, I am not just saying Advaita Vedanta, in all forms of spirituality, Jnana, Bhakti, Yoga, Karma Yoga, all of these, and say, there is a solution. Really? You can really overcome suffering, you can really attain lasting peace and joy. Yes, proof. Look at all the saints and enlightened persons in all the religions and throughout history. One thing common to all of them. They have attained, in some sense, they have attained some deep peace within, which enables them to cope with life far better than we can. It is worth having. What they have got to share with us, it's worth exploring and getting. So that is the promise of spirituality. Swami Vivekananda, when he came here to the United States, one of the lines he was fond of quoting, Upanishadic lines, Shrinvantu Vishve Amritasya Putraha Aye Dhamani Divyani Tastu Vedaham Purusham Mahantam Aditya Varnam Dhamasav Parastat Dhameva Viditva Ati Mrityumeti Nanya Pantha Vidyate Ayanaya What does it mean? Listen to me, ye children of immortal bliss. Those of us who are going to die, death sentence, all. Huh? The, somebody joked, life is a disease with 100% fatality. <laughs> so, but he's saying to us, you are children of immortal bliss, you are immortal. Just the reverse of one thing guaranteed in life, death, he's saying the reverse, you are immortal. Even you, the gods in heaven, devatas, you do not know this, this teaching I am giving to you. The Upanishad Krishi says, what is that? Vedaham Purusham Mahantam. There is this infinite reality which I have realized. What is that like? Aditya Varnam. Blazing forth like the sun. Not with the material light. With the light of awareness. Existence, consciousness, bliss. This infinite being. And Tamasak Parastha. Forever beyond the darkness of death. Of decay. Of suffering of human limitation. Such a thing is there. Good, suppose it's there, so what? Tameva ati meti. By knowing that, by realizing that, by attaining that, one goes beyond death. The human becomes the divine. The mortal becomes the immortal by realizing that. Any other way? <coughs> Economics, politics, war, to become immortal? Nanyaf pantha vidyate There is no other path. There is no other solution. Everything else is a limited solution, temporary, just for a while. Ultimately, you will be left with nothing. So, this path of spiritual illumination, this is the promise. Tameva viditva ati mrityumeti. Let us go to the core first, the Upanishadic core, the path of jnana, of knowledge. Upanishad says, just take a look at yourself. We mentioned, we talked about this on Friday. Take a look at yourself. Notice that 
under all circumstances, all of life is experienced in awareness. When you're listening, you're surely aware. When we are seeing, you're surely aware. What we are seeing is different. What we listen to is different. When we uh, smell, taste, touch, we are aware. Our experiences of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching are all different. For each one of us and for each of us throughout the day keeps changing. These aware, these little, little experiences keep changing. But one thing is, all of these experiences require awareness, consciousness. I'm using the word indifferently. Awareness, consciousness. Chaitanya, awareness. Number one, it's constant awareness. All our life is in this awareness. Without awareness, no life, no experience. And this is not something that only Upanishad is saying or you know Hinduism, Buddhism is saying. Someone no less than just a few years ago, Christoph Koch is the chief scientist of the Paul Allen Brain Institute. He said, consciousness is the most important thing in our lives. And say, no, what about life is more important? No, consciousness is more important. He gave an example. He said, supposing somebody tells me that um, uh, if, if uh, we'll give you a billion dollars, but we'll make you unconscious, we'll take away your consciousness. See, somebody will take my, a limb away and give me a billion dollars, I might be willing to become a billionaire and lose one limb, maybe. But I will lose my consciousness and get a billion dollars forever, I will never be conscious again. What's the use? If I am in coma, I'm perfectly alright, but in coma, and I'm a billionaire, what is the use? So, he says, consciousness is the most important thing in our lives. We are aware all the time. And in our life, consciousness, we experience all of life. He says, so what? It's a very ordinary thing you are saying. Yes, but you draw attention to it. Most ordinary thing, it's the most important thing. Most ordinary, always there, freely available, we never notice it. It's like, Sri Ramakrishna said, there was the story of the washerman. You have to imagine India, the old traditional, with no washing machine. So the washerman will come and collect our dirty laundry, take it uh, to the river bed and there they will clean it thoroughly. You see uh, how they will beat the, I don't know how many of you have seen, they will beat, yeah. Those who have come from India you have seen, they will beat it on the rocks and they will clean it nicely. They know the, the life of your clothes will be reduced thoroughly, <laughs> but it will be very clean. And then they will put it on the, and scrub it and put it on the rocks to dry and all of that. So this washerman found a unique stone, um, which he had never seen earlier. It's nice for scrubbing the dirty clothes, scrub the dirty clothes with it. Then one day, he thought, this stone is quite unique. Let me ask my friend, the vegetable seller, uh, how, how valuable is it? The vegetable seller said, it's very shiny stone. I will give you 10 rupees for it. Luckily, the washerman did not sell it. He took it to, he said, to... Um, you know, somebody was little more knowledgeable and each person gave, offered more 50 rupees for it, 100 rupees for it. Finally he took it to a diamond merchant. The diamond merchant said, this is the finest and biggest diamond I've ever seen. I will give you a million rupees for it or 10 million rupees for it. And so all the wants, the sorrows, the financial difficulties of the washerman were removed because of that stone. It was a big diamond. He had been the stone was with him all the time. He did not recognize what it was. He was using it for scrubbing clothes. The diamond is with us. We don't recognize it for what it is. We are using it. Right now you are using it. What are we using it for? Not for scrubbing clothes. For seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, for thinking, imagining, being afraid, being joyful, desiring, hating, loving, fighting. All of what we do in conscious life. It's all done in and through consciousness, which is the greatest diamond that we ever have. So this most valuable consciousness, Upanishad calls our at, uh, eye towards, attention towards that. It's always there. It's the most important thing in our lives. It does not die. Uh, when our whole world disappears in dreams, consciousness is there. Without consciousness, dreams are not possible. Deep sleep also, according to Advaita Vedanta, deep sleep is not an absence of consciousness. It's a consciousness of absence. So it, consciousness continues. There is no lack, there is no absence of consciousness ever. 
And the claim is that when this body will die, you will continue to be conscious. You will continue. Consciousness will continue. So are we supposed to accept it on faith? Can you give us, can you prove it? I can actually. Think about it. Where, why do we say when the body is dead, that the person is dead also? Why do we say that? Right now, when I look at you, I am interacting with the person. That mind, that those thoughts and the consciousness behind it all, that's the person. Now, if the body dies, I cannot interact with the person anymore because the doors of interaction are all shut down. That person cannot see me, hear me, that person, person cannot react, smile, frown, nothing. Because the physical uh, instrument has been destroyed or damaged. But how do I know that the person is gone? The only one way you can say that if you can prove that the body is generating the person. The person and the body are the same thing if you can prove body goes, person goes. Person and the body are the same thing if you can prove body goes, person goes. But has anybody been able to prove not yet? In fact, that is now what is called the hard problem of consciousness. How to show that consciousness is generated by the brain? There is close correlation between conscious events and brain, but neuronal activity in the brain. Correlation. Correlation is not causation. If you can prove that the body alone is generating this person, then when the body goes, the person also is gone. But that has not been proven yet. That is the hard problem, so-called hard problem of consciousness. If you think about it, we are making a big mistake. When I talk with you, interact with you, I'm interacting with a person. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm interacting with this body. Now when the body goes, I say the person is also gone. You're making a jump, an assumption there. Many times they have shown comatose. You think nobody is there, brain dead also maybe. Again comes back. Sometimes. Or uh, person reports that you thought I was comatose but I could feel everything inside. That has also been reported a number of times. Anyway, consciousness continues even when the body dies, consciousness continues. Awareness is that, that one immortal reality which continues. Not only that, Problems are at the level of the body. Problems are at the level of the mind, not at the level of consciousness. You see, I am overweight, depressed because of overweight. I am overweight, which is overweight. Is consciousness overweight? Consciousness is 100, uh, 200 pounds? No, it can't be. I am miserable, I am depressed. Is consciousness depressed or is consciousness revealing the depression in the mind? Consciousness is revealing the depression in the mind. The same consciousness, you, were revealing the mind without depression. The same consciousness is revealing the mind with depression. And hopefully soon the depression, the black clouds will go away. Same consciousness will reveal the mind without depression. At no time was the consciousness depressed. The vast sky above and dark clouds come, hides the sun. The sun is not hidden. Our experience of the sun is hidden because intervening clouds. Similarly, it's not that the consciousness is ever affected by the ups and downs of the mind. Then problems, misery, anger, hatred, negativity, mind, not consciousness, not awareness. Same awareness unaffected reveals the ups and downs in the mind. Consciousness, what does it want? What need does it have? In the body, I, I say, I want comfort. I want a little air condition. I want a little warmth in the cold. In the mind, the same consciousness will say, I want praise from others. I want a little entertainment from uh, the world and so on. But apart from body and mind, consciousness itself, what does it want? Nothing. It's perfect. It's complete. It's purna, full. It's only when it's limited through body-mind, a lot of desires pop up, which are the conditionings in the mind and in the senses in the body. But consciousness itself does not have any desire. They are perfectly full. Consciousness is one. It's not that there are many consciousnesses here. One consciousness shining through many bodies and minds. 
Conscious from that perspective, you feel one with everybody. There's a divine unity, one light shining in and through all living beings, all human beings, all sentient creatures, one consciousness shining through. Krishna says to Arjuna, Kshetra Gyam Chapi Maam Vidhi Sarva Kshetra Shubharata Know me to be the one knower, one consciousness in all the fields, in all bodies and minds. I am the one consciousness. This is the idea of God in Vedanta. What is God in Vedanta? It is the one consciousness in all living beings. Krishna says this in the Bhagavad Gita. This immortal consciousness, this ever trouble free consciousness, this ever fulfilled consciousness, this ever, um, this one consciousness where there is no separation, no hatred possible. This is the foundation of all morality and ethics. This is your real nature. Tattva Masi. You are that. This is what the Upanishads talk about as the path of knowledge. You just see it, notice it, appreciate it, stay with it and try to act accordingly. The big, big order, but still, this is the path of knowledge. Nisargadatta Maharaj was once asked, how did you become enlightened? Brahma Jnani, he used to live in Mumbai. So he, his answer was very simple. My Guru told me I am Brahman. I believed him. And, and next, I lived accordingly. Third part is so important. And Guru told me that you are Brahman. Everybody, we all here. Then I believed him. Some of us do believe that. But third is the most important. I lived accordingly. I acted accordingly. Became enlightened. <laughs> so, this is the royal path of knowledge. Shravana Manana Nidityasana. Listen to this again and again and again till it begins to make sense. Second step. Begins to make, listen to again and again, Shravana. Begins to make sense, Manana. And then it's a fact, finally. It, that Nididhyasana helps their Vedantic meditation. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Shravana, have I heard the teachings? Shravana. Then you can tick, I've heard. You might be surprised how few actually hear. Then, Manana, I've heard it, but do I get it? Have I understood it? Second, Manana. If you have done, if you can tick the second box, your uh, process of reflection is over. Third, is it real for me? Is it a fact? that all of this is an appearance in consciousness, is it a fact? Then you have completed the third one. Can I manifest it? Can, can I say, I lived accordingly? The moment you try to live accordingly, you will find a lot of resistance coming up from the world, from the body, from the mind. The mind is designed to act as a person, limited person. It will immediately resist. So, that is the result of Nididhyasa. Then you can say it's complete. Difficult? All right. Here is another path. I'm going to show you these different options for dealing with our problems. The other path is deal directly with the mind. Not with the self which is Atman. I have to realize that. No, deal with the mind. The mind is the source of all our problems. Notice, it's only when the mind is active that we have problems. So, in the waking state, in the dream state, we can have in waking state so many problems, in dreams also we can have a nightmare. But when the mind becomes quiet, whole samsara disappears. And no problem. So that means, should we, should we go to sleep and never wake up again? No, that will not work because that's a state of tamas, of blankness. Many people try that. What else is uh, drinking, taking drugs, you know? it's that only. Trying to erase one's unhappiness by indulging in some kind of uh, intoxicant or something so that I can sort of forget all that for a while. It never works. Because whatever we push aside will come back and often with redoubled force. Problems keep on accumulating if we don't deal with it. Vivekananda himself in Banaras, in the Durga temple, he's walking, so big, big monkeys are there. They started chasing him. He started running. They chased him even more. He runs faster. Then an old monk who was watching him shouted, Stop! Face the brute, Samnakaro. Vivekananda turned around, the monkey stopped. They looked at him up and down and they walked away. <laughs> and then later in the United States when he came here and back in India, he would often tell them, face the brute. Face the problem in your life. The problems are not as big as you think. If you, if you call up the reserves of 
of courage, of boldness. Others have faced problems and overcome them, so shall I. They were human beings, I am a human being too. Why human being? I am one with God, I am the Atman. I shall face the problems and overcome them. Face it boldly, they will disappear. Now the mind can be trained. So meditation, that's the path of meditation. One, we have very little awareness of how much peace and joy is possible if we take the path of meditation. There are different ways to do this. One is called Upasana. Upasana literally means to sit next to. I am Brahman, very difficult. All right. Then you conceive of that ultimate reality as existence, consciousness, bliss. Some ultimate reality is there. That is the source of the idea of God in different theistic religions. So think of that. And now sit near it. This is literally the meaning of Upasana. Upa, near, asana, put, put your seat, put your seat near God. The presence of God. Feel the presence of God with eyes closed, with eyes open. It is the same divinity in all beings. With eyes closed, you visualize it. So, so many techniques of Upasana are there. Every one of these temples you will have, a, in each deity there will be a Dhyana Mantra. A meditation, which is basically a visualization. The deity which is imagined, visualized in the heart, only a representation of that you see as the uh, image which is consecrated and worshipped. So that is visualized in the heart. There is a mantra to that. There is a way of visualizing. Then you stay with it. That's the practice of Upasana. Basically that is the idea of in all dualistic meditation. These are difficult but powerful practices. Even if you do for a few minutes every day, you feel upliftment, a sattvic, wholesome uh, feeling, a sublime feeling within and that radiates in your life. One Swami, um, today itself I was talking with a Swami in Chicago Vedanta Society. He was talking about a, a Swami who, uh, whom I did not see, Nitya Swarupananda Ji, uh, who established the Institute of Culture in uh, Ramakrishna Mission uh, Institute of Culture in Gold Park in Calcutta. So this is the Swami whose translation of Ashtamakra Gita we all use, Nitya Swarupananda Ji. But they say those who have seen in meditating, sitting in meditation, rock solid like a statue for eight or nine hours all through the night. Sitting down in, uh, in the late night, getting up early in the morning. His face flushed with a, like a divine radiance. So one can dive deep in meditation. One may not be able to do that eight or nine hours at a stretch, but few minutes also. It has a great effect. Remember, Shant man mein bhala samsar kaun dekha hai? If you can make your mind serene, if we can make our minds calm, you will see all the problems become much smaller. You are able to handle the problems with a smile on your lips and calmness inside. Swami Turiyananda Ji, uh, he in his old age, he was a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. In his old age, he was in Banaras in the hospital there. Lot of physical ailments. So somebody asked him, remember Banaras is very hot in summer. Somebody asked him, Swami, are you suffering very much? He said, by the grace of God, by the grace of Sri Ramakrishna, in Bengali he said, inside it is like a mass of ice. So cool inside. What is that cool inside? It's not that he has an internal air conditioner, not that. It is that he feels the presence of the divine continuously. That's enough. As the Gita says, established in which even the greatest sorrows cannot shake you. Once Swami Shivanandaji, another disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, in Banaras again, he, um, he was ill and he was suffering through the night. Uh, he had asthmatic problems. In the morning somebody asked him, Swami, are you suffering very much? He said, last night I was suffering. I had this vision of Shiva. Vishwanath, he said Baba Vishnath, uh, so uh, Banaras. He came and he separated the two. Separated the two. That's all, he did not explain, but we now understand what he meant. I am awareness ever free of all troubles. Troubles are there in the body. Once in Belurmat, again in his old age, before he passed away, somebody in the morning came, we heard last night, there was a lot of asthmatic problem. So, uh, are you suffering very much? So, Swami, are you suffering very much? And Swami said, no, 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 I'm quite well. And 
Then they said, but we heard last night, whole last night, there was uh, asthmatic problem. And then the Swami said, oh, you mean the body? No, no, it is not at all well. It's not doing well at all. <laughs> the two are separate. Even now for us also it's separate. But we don't see it. You know, what's the way to see it? Again, I'm going back to the path of knowledge. I'll give you one more hint. The hint is like this. Suppose I see my face uh, in the mirror. So there's a mirror. And I see my face. It's a reflected face. But that reflected face is not my real. My real face is here. The mirror is there. And the reflected face is in the mirror. From the reflected face, if I notice the reflected face, and from there, if the way I understand, oh, this is the reality. Now notice the problem with the real face is you cannot see it directly. You can only see a reflection or a picture. But you know it's there. You have no doubt at all. That reflected face just proves that you are there. Okay, mirror is the mind. Reflected face in the mirror is the consciousness that we are all feeling. The reflected consciousness in the mind, chidabhasa, which we are feeling there. Just as you would go from the mirror, reflected face to the real face, that turn. I can't explain it any better. Similarly, notice the mind, the thoughts, and that you are aware. From that awareness, turn. Just like turning from the reflected face to the real face. Turn from that awareness to yourself, the source of all awareness, the real awareness. If you know what I mean, maybe you can at least try it sometime. Then we, and sometimes what happens is we discover it. We immediately see that, oh, this is what I am. Having discovered it, then appreciate what it is that you have discovered. Don't be like that washerwoman with the, washerman with the rock. Notice, what will you notice? Notice that it's always there. Notice that it is the source of all my conscious experiences. Notice that it is the one which reveals happiness, misery, ups and downs. It is the one which reveals waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Notice that it has no problems whatsoever. Notice that it is immortal, it is ever full. Notice that it can't be different for different people. And our waking is different, our dreams are different, but our deep sleep experience is the same for everybody. If deep sleep is same, then the sakshi of deep sleep, the witness of deep sleep, how much more it has to be the same thing. So it is one consciousness. So notice this. And you will begin to see what will happen is, I am that. So I am fine. All the time. Choicelessly. Anyway, that is the way of knowledge. We are now in the way of meditation. Way of meditation also does that. Yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodha. Calming the uh, vrittis of the mind is yoga. Difficult. All right, much better way, I will tell you, the way of bhakti. Same consciousness, you see it as my beloved Krishna, Radha Krishna, as my beloved Rama, as my beloved Hanuman, Anjaneya, Narayana, Mahadeva. And hold on to that. That is the reality of this universe. When you are holding on to that, you are holding on to the reality of this universe. One sadhu said, Bahut bada sahara hai. It is if you want help in life, that is the greatest help. And one advantage of that help, what help I am talking about? Ishwara, Bhagavan, God. One advantage of that is, your Brahman is the same, pure consciousness is the same in problem, in life and death. And perfectly healthy, same consciousness will reveal. Body is dying, same consciousness will reveal. You pray to the consciousness, please cure the body. No. Nothing to it. Same consciousness, perfectly all right, say, under all circumstances. But Bhagavan is not like that. When Sadhu said, um, they, uh, they asked him, in, at one time, some, there were dacoits in India. And the police went and caught the dacoits. And they said, we found these dacoits who were robbing people. They were worshipping Ma Kali, they were doing Hanuman Chalisa, before going and robbing people. What is this? Huh? Doesn't God punish them? That sadhu actually in Hindi was saying, the police wala ham se kaha, Are Maharaj ji, ham dekhe wo dakhe chha chha ghanta bhajan karte hai. <laughs> so what is this? God will not punish those evil doers? Then he said something beautiful. The sadhu said, Ishwar Tattva, the principle of God is, Ishwar Bhakt Pakshapati hai. The Lord 
takes care of the devotee. Yes, not that the Lord will support us in all our um, nefarious mission, our mischief, but Lord will carefully bring it out of, out of, bring us out of that mischief also safely, not with the stick. So there is a great secret to love of God. It's the greatest power in the universe, and it will be on your side if you love God. And all the problems which we have, it's not that God will support us when, when we do wrong things, but God will carefully, like a loving parent, teach us and bring us out carefully. Otherwise, otherwise, danda, stick. What is the stick? Law of karma. Terrible stick. Terrible stick. You might not believe this. When Covid started, I was at Harvard University in the classroom. Harvard was one of the first to shut down. They recognized what problem is coming. There was a classroom. They were discussing Christian theology there. And the professor said, she, Stephanie Paulson, she said, in old Jewish uh, theology it's there that God, what is the daily routine of God? So God also reads scriptures and all this. So nice routine is given, daily routine. But one time God sits, there's one throne. It's called the throne of judgment. God sits there and then God is merciless. So he said, she said, I, I fear that now, in the months ahead, God is sitting on that throne and we pray that do not sit there, sit on the throne of compassion. And so that compassionate face of God comes to the devotee. It's, it's a very important thing because we, we must admit, one sadhu said, apni satchai swikar karna badi bhari cheez hoti hai Mahatma ji. Recognize your own truth Mahatma ji, your own sadhu. You need not tell anybody else where we are, what we are, what my standard is, what my capacity is. At least internally I must be aware of it. And we, most of us, we will feel we need help. We need support. And the greatest support is Ishwara, is Bhagavan. So that's another path to solving our problems. And Ishwara has a special faculty of not only solving spiritual problems like Buddha. Second arrow he will take care of, not first arrow. Ishwara can take care of both. See, somebody might ask, in temple we do puja to cure the illness of a beloved person. Somebody wants money, they do puja. So that's the first arrow. That's not spiritual solution, that's a worldly problem. But Ishwara can do both. Because this universe is under the control of Ishwara, of the Divine Mother. Especially the Shakti can do both, Divine Mother. Only thing is, that requires faith. That starts with faith. If you say, I don't believe all those things, well, you are the loser, who cares? And finally, one more, karma yoga, one little thing I will say and conclude. You see, a lot of our problems diminish when we are not so concerned with ourselves. I have seen many people, the swamis, um, devotees, who have many problems, personally health problems and so on, they are not concerned. They are so much concerned with taking care of, somebody is taking care of an institution, somebody is taking care of families, communities, devotees. And so entire energy concern goes there, their own problem, they don't think too much about it. Karma Yoga helps us to transcend our problems, solve our problems by rising above, by making yourself bigger and bigger. Our own problems become tinier and tinier. In all these ways, they are weapons with which we can fight the battle of samsara, kurukshetra. I'll end with a sentence which I heard from a sadhu 16 years ago in Gangotri. We were studying Ashtavakra Gita. This sadhu is a Punjabi sadhu. He used to live in a cave there. Once he told us, Ashtavakra we are studying this um, uh, Ganga flowing by near Bhagirathi, this uh, towering mountains and glaciers, very beautiful setting. I still remember the sadhu said, ये तो शस्त्र है महात्मा जी हाथ में शस्त्र है और दुश्मन से दो थप्पड़ खा के रोते रोते वापस आ गए क्या मजा है महात्मा जी he says these are weapons oh monks when the enemy enemy samsara greed and anger and lust and disappointment and negativity when they come and give you a slap and you come back weeping you are armed with all these weapons what's the fun in that Fight the negativities, fight uh, your battle in samsara, you are armed with this weapon, this wonderful spiritual arsenal, jnana, knowledge, direct path to enlightenment. 
dhyana, control of the mind, most powerful instrument. Bhakti, the greatest power in the universe comes to your help. And karma, spiritualize your daily life. The very powerful instruments are there, all at your disposal, all the time. Fight the battle of life, you will have a joyful victory. Why worry? Why come back weeping that, oh, these problems and that problem? Kya vaja hai, Mahatma Ji? Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Panamastu Thank you so much. Do we have time for a few questions? A few questions were there yesterday. They, will, they should get the first chance. Somebody is there from yesterday who had asked a question? Nobody. Yes, you are there? Come, come here. Please come here. Yeah. And others who want to ask, a few questions we can take. Can you please line up here? Yes. Like yesterday, or those who are not here yesterday, just That gentleman should come first and then you can come. Please come. actually drives one to uh, in the self inquiry path the sadhana um, and also know, knowing that in the process of finding the goal reaching the goal I am slowly going to lose myself as such like uh, I become one with the um, Brahman uh, lose my identity as such so is that uh, would not, not be a uh, cause of fear uh, like what actually keeps me right, going let, on. let me stop you right there. The same question was asked to Vivekananda when he was here in America more than a hundred years ago. What will happen to my personality? And he would make fun a little bit. He would say personality. But we don't have a personality yet. It's always a work in progress. Imagine yourself, sir, when you were um, five years old, when you were ten years old. The personality, the individuality is so different from what it is now. He says, only after enlightenment do we truly become individual because we have reached reality. And that is the unchanging reality. We don't lose ourselves, we find ourselves. You are on the rock solid ground there. It's not some abstract concept. The sadhus in Uttarakhand have a very nice language. Thasa thas bharpu, they say. <laughs> this universe is packed solid with God. Every bit of it is existence consciousness place. There is no space for any universe. <laughs> it just appears like this. So we really find ourselves. When you say Aham Brahmasmi, for the first time we have touched our own reality. No fear at all. It's an occasion of great joy. And this individual person of Arun, it will continue. It will continue as long as this particular body lasts, but you are free of it. See, the individuality never becomes free. You become free of the individual. It will remain. Notice Vivekananda, Ramakrishna, Ramana Maharshi, all. After enlightenment also, same body and same personality also more or less continued. Internally there is a vast difference. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, the one question is like, what is the significance of sadhana? It means finding it by myself, like even knowing that I am Brahmasmi in the beginning. What is the significance of, again, my, myself finding it? Again, is it... Uh, what importance of sadhana? Yeah, means not yes. the reinventing the wheel. Right. No, no, sadhana is most important. Otherwise, what will happen is, I listen, I study, listen to so many YouTube lectures and everything. I also begin to get it, but then you will find it stops there. Nothing more. Why? Because the instrument has not been perfected yet. See, in any knowledge, there are three things. Pramata, Prameya and Pramana. Pramata is the knower. Prameya is what is to be known. Brahman. I am saying in a very technical way of putting it. Known also within quotes. So what is to be known? Brahman. And Pramana is the source of knowledge, the Upanishad, the teaching which reveals it to me. Brahman is perfect. No problems at all. 
Teachings, Upanishads, Vedanta, perfect, no problem at all. Then where is the problem? With the, in the knower. And that problem has to be cleared up through sadhana. And sadhana, threefold. Yesterday uh, we talked about it. First, karma yoga, selflessness. Moral, ethical life, selfless life. Then, upasana, bhakti, focus. And then this will work. If this sadhana is not done, some one great teacher of Vedanta said, if you don't do the sadhana, you will feel that I have learnt a very nice philosophy. That's all. Clever philosophy. If you do the sadhana, it will lead to enlightenment. You will become a Jivan Mukta. This is a big difference. See, today itself I was talking with Swamiji at the Vedanta Society. It's two simple things. He said, first of all, holding on to the truth. The more effort we make to hold on to the truth, it itself becomes a sadhana. We have to make sacrifices all the time. But it keeps us genuine. And practice of selflessness. The more we practice selflessness, how do you love everybody? Only way to love is to be selfless. Otherwise you will love those who are good for you. And dislike those who are, who are inimical or not advantageous for you. Then we are loving only the self, not the people actually. If I don't bother about myself, selfless, because I have realized the capital S self, Atman, I don't really bother about this little person, then I will not have this calculation in my mind. Who are useful to me, nice to me, good to me, who are problematic for me, who are indifferent to me. This calculation is always me, me, me. That me will be dropped out. Then general, genuine love and all it will come. These practices are small practices, but they are the foundation for realizing Aham Brahma Asmi. One sadhu, he said, Sat Swarup ko janna chahate ho. You want to realize the infinite existence. Lekin Satya nahi bolte ho. I want to realize the one reality of the universe, but in my own life I don't stick to reality. How is that possible? So these small things, we are talking about high philosophy, but it's taking, Advaita Vedanta takes for granted foundation of ethical moral life. Alright, we'll give chance to others. Please, come. But good questions. This is an important question. My name is Amit. I, I have a very um, basic question. Uh, I've been listening to your YouTube lectures and uh, what uh, confusion or question I have is, is it the mind that is what is the reason for all the sorrows and sufferings and pains that we talked about? And what you are trying to the sadhana, is it just to train your mind that what it is in the mind is All not right. true? Let me take it step by step. I listen, get what you said. Okay. Is it the mind which is the cause of sorrow? Actually, no. How do you prove that? Enlightened people who have claimed go beyond sorrow, they also have a mind. It's not that they don't have a mind. There's a clearly body is there. If body is there, why mind won't be there? So, body mind is there for the enlightened, for the Jivan Mukta. With the mind also, they don't feel that there is any, any sorrow at all. So, what is, the, what is the problem? The problem is not the body. Problem is not the mind. Problem is not that I am living in this world. While living in this world, with this body and mind, one can be beyond sorrow. The problem is ignorance and knowledge. I am giving an Advaitic answer. I do not know my own reality. That one knows his own reality. This is the crucial difference. After that, there are differences in the mind. In order to reach that reality, to understand that, one process of cleansing the mind is absolutely necessary. Without that, nobody has ever become enlightened. Uh, there are a lot of details about this, but in principle, this is the answer. Problem is not mind. Problem is not even samsara. Problem is ignorance, agyan. Anipat Swami Ji. Uh, my name is uh, Sunil. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for shining a spotlight on um, Advaita this weekend, and perhaps more importantly, from my perspective, for um, your message of unity across not just the different frameworks within Vedanta, but also across different faiths. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Um, my question relates to uh, my difficulty in understanding 
the concept of Brahman as consciousness with a capital C. Mm -hmm. um, when I think and hear the word consciousness, uh, I think of it in um, everyday language as if I am conscious of the world around me, I perceive things. Um, is that inaccurate and is it more accurate perhaps to think of consciousness with a capital C as simply the power source that allows me through my mind and body to perceive the world. Correct. What you said just now. What we normally experience as consciousness and what is studied in consciousness studies and what a doctor will talk about, a neuroscientist will talk about when they use the word consciousness with a small c, that we all experience just now. But what Vedanta is talking about is consciousness with a capital C. There's no English word for it, but there are many Sanskrit words for it. Chaitanya, Chit, Samvit, Bodha, Bodh, uh, then Chiti. So many words are there. Jnana, Swarupa. So, so many words are there in Vedanta for the cap consciousness with capitals. In Sanskrit, so many words are there. Now, it does not help to say small c cap capital C because if I am aware of only the small c consciousness just now and you tell me that there is a capital C consciousness, what is the link? How do I get there? That question arises. And so Vedanta shows us the way of getting there. All these techniques, Dridrishya Viveka, Panchakosha Viveka, Avastatra Vichara, all of them are telling you to draw attention to consciousness with small c and from there go to consciousness with capital C. Go means it's already there. Just to become aware of yourself as that consciousness with capital C. Two examples here I will say and just think about it. Link between consciousness small c, consciousness capital C. Are they the same or different? Same and different. How? One is the mirror and reflected face example which I mentioned. So your face in the mirror, is that the same as your face or different? Well, it's different. It's not exactly this, this face. If I go away from the mirror, the reflected face will go away. But my real face will always be there. And my real face alone is reflected there. Uh, so they are different. But it's a reflection of this face only. So how do you go from the reflected face to the real face is exactly how you go from um, reflected consciousness to the real consciousness. That's one example, only an example. You have to sit with it for some time to see what's there. Another example is beautiful example, sunlight, moonlight. So at night, the world, dark world is illumined by moonlight. But we know there is no such thing as moonlight. It is the light of the sun which is being reflected from the moon to the world. Similarly, consider the sun as capital C consciousness. Consider the moon as the mind and the moonlight as small c consciousness. It is the moonlight alone which illumines the world at night. At night, all our whatever we do is in the moonlight. Suppose only that moonlight is there. Sunlight itself is not directly visible. Sun is not directly visible at night. But it is the sunlight which is powering the moonlight. Not even powering, it is the moonlight. Exactly like that. All our small c consciousness, which we use for seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, remembering, desiring, hating, all of that. Those are vrittis of the mind lit up by the small c consciousness, which is nothing other than you, the you, the capital C consciousness. This shifting from the small c consciousness to capital C consciousness. Right now, if I say, I am that small c consciousness, that's what we'll feel. No, no, no. It's, it's as foolish as saying, I am the face in the mirror. You have forgotten the real face. You are saying, I am the face in the mirror. Just like the real face cannot be directly seen. Just like at night the sun cannot be directly seen. Right now, you cannot directly see yourself as pure consciousness. And that's good. Why you cannot directly see yourself as pure consciousness? Because pure consciousness is you. It's not an object. It is pure consciousness alone which is seeing everything in this world with these instruments of mind and senses. So that's as direct as I can make it. Getting this message from Bhagavan in the temple. No more. These fellows will get enlightened. <laughs> Stop here. <laughs> Come. So don't join anymore. That is the cut off of the line. Yes. So, Aviji, my name is Lokesh. Um, I was nervous yesterday, so I wrote my question down. Um, I agree that Advaita removes suffering, gives you the feeling of uh, Purnatvam. 
It explains our experience better than any other theory put forth. Um, and it's likely the truth. The thing is, um, you can be content and still be curious. Um, you asked us to look at our own experience. In the dream, both the dreamer and the dream characters are in ignorance. Um, if we look at uh, the dream experience, our Brahma seems to be in uh, ignorance. But his dream world seems to be different because if Swami Vivekananda was one of my dream characters and he's saying, hey, this is a dream, this is not real, I would wake up. But he's not when um, Ramana Maharshi or Swami Vivekananda was enlightened. Uh, but this also goes against the theory that there is no shadow in the sun uh, if he is ignorant. Uh, but if we see Maya as the, his power or um, uh, it, it is uh, Leela, then that brings up another problem that um, this mental creation of this apparent reality is also an action and he's not supposed to take any action. Okay, um, can I just talk? Each each of these can take a lecture to reply to. So let me just reply to each option first as we go on. Or do you have a separate question? Good question, yes. Okay. Um, so can we say that, yes, uh, Advaita explains Maya at a transaction level and it removes Maya at a transaction level, but it cannot explain Maya at Brahman's level? Okay, so two questions about Maya. How can there be darkness in the sun? Uh, when the sun is right over it, as you said, there can't be a shadow. That's, there can't be darkness in the sun. How can there be Maya or ignorance in Brahman? Question. Um, and then the second question is about the Leela, Leela theory. So, um, let me come from the Leela. Leela theory is one step lower. All this world is the Leela of Brahman. Actually, somebody asked Sri Ramakrishna, why is there so much suffering if God is real? And one of the answers, Sri Ramakrishna gave three answers. So one of the answers, one answer was we can't understand what, uh, it's beyond our understanding. That may be true actually. Second answer, the gentleman who asked, it was in Calcutta. The gentleman who asked was not satisfied. So the second answer Sri Ramakrishna gave was Leela. This world is the Leela of God. What can we do? And the gentleman was very annoyed. He said, it is Leela for God, it is death for us. It is Leela, they playing. But I, I am here dying. What kind of Leela is this? So much trouble and sorrow and massive suffering. Then Sri Ramakrishna gives the third answer for which there is no comeback. He says, oh, it is death for us. Sri Ramakrishna says, and who are you? We don't even know who is the one suffering. He says, investigate that, your problem will be solved. Then if you investigate that, you come to Advaita. Who are you? There, then if you ask the question, why is all this appearing? Maya. What is Maya? Basically, it's ignorance. Because of ignorance, all this problem is there. But uh, how can there be ignorance in Brahman, if one asks? Let me give you one answer. This is, a, uh, this is the, one of the seven major questions leveled against Maya by Ramanuja Acharya. Uh, Sapta Vidhanupapakti. Seven inconsistencies in the, the three theory of Maya. But all of them have beautiful answers. If you raise the question and see the answer, you will understand Advaita even better. Okay, here is one answer. How can there be Maya in Brahman? Ignorance in Brahman. Answer, there isn't. See, when you say there is something, remember, this is, you have to be strictly logical. There is something, it must be countably different. There is a mobile phone here and there is a piece of paper here. So here is a piece of paper, one. Here is a mobile phone, two. But if I say, here is wood and here is a lecture, Swami, please show it separately. I can't. It's not that there are two here, wood and a lecture. The wood is just the name, form and function which has been, the lecture is just the name, form and function, Nama Rupa Vyavahara, which has been imposed upon the wood. It is not a second thing apart from the wood. Exactly like that, Maya is not a second reality apart from Brahman. It functions. It does what it's supposed to do. It even appears. But it's not count to be a second reality apart from Brahman. So apart from Brahman, no to Advaita. That's all the Advaita is interested in. After that, why only Maya? Have the whole universe appear. Advaita will say no to. Only Brahman is there. It's worth thinking about.
Let me put it in another way. There is no causal link between this and Brahman. It's a devastating statement to make. I remember I said this in the discussion with the scientist, brilliant man. I really think how this man was not read Vedanta, just I have to open my mouth, he gets it. He said that his last question was, why is all this appearing there? In my, I hope they put it on YouTube, you'll see it's very dramatic. Uh, sometimes he is asking a question, I'm running to the board and drawing something, he's taking a picture of that, like it's going on, very interesting uh, debate. He said, why everything is appearing like this? I said, you can't ask that because there is no causal link between this and Brahman. He was saying, when I said this, he said, no causal link? He said, yes. He said, it has to be like that. Okay, next. Please come. Ask, tell us your name and ask the question. My name is Kumkum and I have a very simple question just for my understanding. When you talk about consciousness, the big C and awareness, is it the same as prana? Prana? Prana is, we translate it as life, but it's a much more, what we say, vyapaka term, a more pervasive term. All of life, all of energy, the cosmic mind, Hiranyagarbha, all is meant by the word prana. Uh, it is called the Vyakta Brahma, the manifest Brahma. But consciousness is beyond that also. Uh, it's as simple as that. If you breathe in and breathe out, you are aware of the breathing in and out. Are you the breath or are you that which is aware of the breath? You are aware of the breath. So you are that conscious entity aware of the breathing in and out. Breathing in and out is just the tip of prana. So you are not prana, but prana is something that serves you. Yeah. Okay. Next. Yes. Pranam Swamiji. Uh, uh, can you throw light on, I'll quote from... Tell Swami. us your name. My name is Richa. Richa. Uh, from Swami Vivekanan, he says, We have to sense God to be convinced that there is a God. We must sense the facts of religion to know that they are facts. Nothing else and no amount of reasoning but our own perceptions can make these things real to us. Can make my belief firm as a rock. Truth has such a face that anyone who sees that face become convinced. And in Vajramrit, Thakur says that uh, Vishwas hua to sab hua. Vichar or tarp se kya hoga? Mai pratyaksh dekh raha hoon ki hoi hi chobis tarp ho hoi hai. Right. So it seems like a vizier circle. No. Good question. But let me just settle it directly. Think about it. Straight answer to that is, what would Advaita Vedanta say to that? Reasoning, philosophy, metaphysics, this is all abstract. If I can directly experience something, that is the only proof that I want to want to have. That's what Vivekananda says. Directly experience something. Yogic path. Philosophy, metaphysics, logic, that seems abstract, second hand, second hand. And it cannot really move you. But now let me, what Advaita Vedanta will say to this, let me say and think about it. What you are philosophizing about, doing logic about, reasoning about is directly available to you, rock solid, all the time. We are not noticing it. The moment this reasoning makes you notice it, you will be convinced. Beyond any, any chance of any doubt. I have seen that it has become the entire universe. I am seeing it. By reasoning, by Advaitic pointing out, you will see that yes, it is the same consciousness which is appearing as everything. I, my real nature, consciousness with capital C, in that the entire universe is appearing. That's what Sri Ramakrishna is saying. Then you are completely convinced. But how do you get to that realization? You can get to it in three ways. One is, depend on God, God will show me bhakti. Other one is, direct practice of meditation. Through samadhi, you will have an experience that will show you yoga. yoga. Third one is, you are already experiencing it. The rock is already in your hand. You have to be introduced to it. This is the diamond. Jnana. All reason, tarka, logic is meant to show you, to clear up the cobwebs in the mind, 
Oh, it's always available to me. All these paths. Which one should we follow? Follow all. Follow all. Why? What is the problem? Thank you. Please come. They're all good questions. And remember, it's not just their question. It could be the question of so many people. And the answer helps so many people. Yes. Swamiji, my name is Ratnam Chitturi. Yes. I have a strange question. <laughs> good. Those are usually the best questions. <laughs> Yesterday, you were referring to Swamiji Vivekananda about uh, every person is a perfect human being. But what is manifest? Ignorance versus knowledge. It's manifestation that makes differences. Right? Now, in uh, DNA, also DNA is the same. Certain manifestation, the switches on and off, it becomes a, a bone cell. Certain combinations, it becomes a neuron. Certain combinations, it becomes a muscle. Right? Is there a parallel? I think there are parallels. Again and again I see whatever little I see of discoveries in biology, in physics, even in mathematics and logic, there are incredible parallels with uh, not just Vedanta, with Sankhya, with, uh, with other ancient Indian philosophical systems. So I ask this to none other than um, Brian Green. He is a leading cosmologist at Columbia. He has done some PBS programs also, Elegant Universe and all. He is also a very famous popularizer of latest science. At Harvard, he was releasing his new book, Until the End of Time. And I asked him that, uh, what do you see as the parallels between ancient Indian thought? He knows ancient Indian thought quite a bit because he said, my elder brother is a monk, a Hindu monk. <laughs> Brian Green said. And we used to have debates. My brother used to say, what all you are saying? All this, uh, these uh, Indians have found many years ago. Now, what do you say? I asked Brian Green, what do you say? He said, what is there in your text is not science, but it is a poetical rendition of the same principles which we are beginning to discover in science. Beautiful. Hmm. Correct? That is correct. Thank you. Namaskar Swamiji. Namaskar. My name is Subhash Arora. Come closer. I've been a teacher and a care of children all my life. I want to ask you uh, a question that we have so much of depth of knowledge, especially in Hindu philosophy, our Vedantas, our textbooks. We have so much vast of knowledge, but I'm trying to find some buzz words or buzz mantras in this whole, you know, kingdom of knowledge. And one of the buzz words which came to me, and I just want to share with you, and you can highlight it, it is independent and dependent. Independent means dependent within me, depend on myself, my knowledge, my eyes, my hearing, my smell, my taste, my mind, depend on it. And the second was dependent, dependent outside on something that is influencing me inside. So if I can be independent and if I take that mantra or the buzzword and keep reminding myself I am independent, dependent on me versus dependent on outside. How will you say and some other buzzword which can enlighten someone? Patience. Nice. Um, in fact, Swami Vivekananda says, whole, all of the entire Hindu approach to life is to adjust the subject to the object. You ultimately a more mature approach Less mature approach is to change the world and society and other people. More mature approach is to change yourself. And actually we need both. A beautiful external environment as far as possible and a beautiful internal environment as far as possible. Okay. Uh, buzzwords. I liked it because I was thinking along the same way. People ask me, all this karma yoga, bhakti yoga, all old style stuff. Tell us buzzwords. One word. Karma Yoga, I don't want to read books and lectures. Raja Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, one word, one word. <laughs> then I found this way. What is, the, what is the entire teaching of Karma Yoga? Selfless, not selfish. That's Karma Yoga. It's all in there. Uh, then Bhakti Yoga is love one, capital O, not many. 
when you scatter your actually the buzzword was love not desire so love one is love of god to that you can love everybody but if you scatter your mind your love into the world in a thousand different ways that becomes desire and leads to unhappiness so love one not many bhakti yoga um then focus not distraction dhyan yoga that should be the mantra for this age i think focus not distraction knowledge of self self knowledge not other knowledge that is gyan yoga these are some buzz words thank you <laughs> <laughs> last question make it good alright <laughs> what's your name ah uh, himant so <clears throat> pranam swami ji so prior to uh, yesterday's discourse and part of today my problem was different but uh, i think the problem got addressed when you explained the 3 by 3 matrix uh, yesterday um so obviously the problem was uh, i held myself in a uh, big self esteem and the lower case self and uh, i was starting on a gyan mark <laughs> thinking that i can remove the ignorance but obviously i frustrated myself in last few years so uh it's time to i guess reevaluate go back and check for chitta vikshep or chitta chitta mala or uh i assume there is a spectrum in between so what is the best way to reevaluate or evaluate what is the question we are at? what is the advice regarding sadhana what should we do Swami Vivekananda's advice is beautiful. You go back to the basics, first principles. Swami Vivekananda said, "The goal of human life is the manifestation of the divinity already within us." Each word is important. Do it either by meditation or by service or love or philosophy. He means knowledge, gyan yoga. By one or more of all of these and be free. That is the whole of religion. now um, notice he said any one of these four gyan yoga bhakti yoga karma yoga and dhyana yoga raja yoga he says any one of these four can lead you to enlightenment and he is saying it solidly on the basis of scriptures if you take up bhakti sutras it does not say do bhakti now after that go to brahma sutra and then read vivek chodamani then you will get enlightenment never it says do you follow this bhakti sutra you will get enlightenment read patanjali yoga sutra it does not say by this we will give you for concentration of mind and then you go to um, you know please go to youtube lecture of sarvabhyam and they will tell you you are brahman no it says you will get enlightenment by this method only so it is true by each of these methods one can uh, traditionally the lineages paramparas are there if you come to a advaita acharya we will always tell you by dhyana ultimately it has to be dhyana yoga if you go to a bhakti acharya a uh, shri vaishnava or a gaudiya vaishnava they will say ultimately it has to be through bhakti only but each of them can work vivekananda's recommendation which i find again and again as the years go by is peculiarly suited to large number of people and to this age is all four a harmony of the four yogas they let there be gyana in your life what you are pursuing the path of knowledge you continue pursuing which is ultimately the highest then meditate regularly seriously sit try to quieten the mind morning and evening have devotion to at least in some form whatever is appeals to you or whatever is your family community tradition do that and be selfless let our life be a blessing to others with this preparation enlightenment is guaranteed four yogas harmony you will find one or the two will pull you gyan yoga will pull you See, it pulled you earlier it will continue to pull you because that is your path but the others even if it feels mechanical please do it it is not the fault of the yoga it is our constitute peculiar constitutional makeup which makes us not suited to that path but where we are lacking if we do it even mechanically only we can benefit so all the four yogas let there be harmony of meditation and philosophy and love and service in all our lives thank you so much on a beautiful note
I'm sure you said, uh, share this sentiment. It's very sad that all three days it's over, but hopefully we will remember everything he said at least for a few weeks. And <laughs> so, just a few more things and we will be done. Uh, Mr. Mahajan wanted to speak, uh, say something, and I told him he only has a minute. And after that, our president, Bakshi Shravaji, will give the vote of thanks and give our Sambhavana and honor Swamiji. After that, the program is officially over. And as usual, you can collect the prasadam outside. Thank you. Uh, before I say the purpose I'm here, I wanted to compliment all the audience today for being here. I also want the audience to know these Vivekanand spiritual lectures and talks would not have been possible at this temple if the seed wasn't sowed but 20 years ago by Dr. Vrain Bisla and Pala Bisla. Believe me, they started this 20 years ago. Finally, I see is bringing fruit. Thank you, Balaji. Thank you, uh, Dr. Saab. And this all wouldn't have been possible if our president, Bakshi Shravalji, had not been very active in this. And uh, we want to thank you, Mr. Rahul and uh, the board. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, let me ask you a question. Did you enjoy the last three days? Yes or no? I didn't hear it. Love. Yes. And this would not have been possible if it was not for this young lady, Nitya Rajan. Please give her a big hand. Come, big. Nitya Ji. Nitya, come here. What a wonderful job she has done. She deserves a standing ovation and blessing from Swamiji. Keep the good work. And Swamiji, thank you. All this wouldn't have been there if you were not here. Thank you. Swami Sarvapiriya Nanda Ji on the behalf of the Board of Trustees and EC for his beautiful discourses for the last three days and they were very very enlightening, inspirational and motivational and let us give a big hand to applause to Swami Ji. We are blessed having him at our temple and we are grateful to him for making this event memorable and successful. So, so thanks Swami Sivanandji he came for the first day for conducting online discourses during pandemic time and st starting last month he started in person discourses at VSC and every first Saturday of each month. So I request you all to join and get his blessings. All these events have been possible because of the efforts of so many dev devotees. And I'd like to thank Nitha Rajanji, Amritsri, and all the BSC committee for organizing th this excellent program. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Bislaji for sponsoring this wonderful program for three days. Thanks Vana Murti Ji, Karthik Subramaniam for setting up the audio, video and live streaming this program. 
thank publicity chair Pratibhan ji and web committee chair and I would like to thank uh, Pasadam chair Renka ji and her team. Thanks to our cooks Surya ji and Santo ji for preparing Pasadam for Swami ji and devotees for all of us. Thank you. Many thanks to our esteemed priest and the religious committee chair Pasanna ji and her team for taking care of the Purna Kumbamam for Swami ji. Thanks to all other staff and all the volunteers for their selfless service to the temple. And following are the upcoming events. Now, on May 21st, 12 Swami Ji are visiting our temple. They are coming from all over the USA to attend the inauguration of the Home of Harmony organized by Vedanta Society of Chicago. And the program starts at 6 p.m. And it will be a proud event to showcase our temple to all the Swamiji. This is going to be a unique event. You know why? As we are planning to host this event on the hill of the Ramallah. And I humbly request you to attend and get blessing from all Swamiji, including Swami Sarvapiriyananda is going to be there too. Thank you. And this will be followed by the complimentary dinner. Thank you. And if you would like to sponsor this program or support us, please give donation to the HTGC. Thank you. I am very happy to announce that this year marks the 36th anniversary of the Rama Temple. And we are planning five day celebration of Pushkaram Ustam from August 4th to August 8th. Please save this date and I humbly request all of you to participate and get blessing of Lord Sri Rama. This is a rare opportunity and please don't miss it. Thanks you all for your generous support and especially for the last two years during the pandemic time. And this is my humble request to all of you. Donate today towards VSC to, <coughs> to organize this kind of program. I am really thankful to all of you. I remember Kabir Jidwa, Chidiya Chonj Bhar Le Gai, Chidiya Chonj Bhar Le Gai, Nadi Nagatayo Neer, Daan Diye Dhan Na Kate Kaya Gai Bhakt Kabir. And we are looking forward to celebrate all the events with all of you. Request you to join us. Thanks for your participation and your support. May Lord Rama bless you all with peace, prosperity and health. Thank you very much.